Greetings from an increasingly chilly Wellington. I'm Matthew Wood and this is Journeys to the Ice, the podcast of the Antarctic Research Centre. This is the first episode in a five-part series in which we'll be taking a look at the work of the ANZIS initiative at the Antarctic Research Centre. By integrating climate records from Antarctic ice, seafloor sediments and temperate glaciers in the New Zealand Southern Alps, ANZIS seeks to reconstruct the environmental responses of Antarctica and New Zealand to past warm extremes, to help generate and fine-tune regional climate models. Through extensive intra- and inter-institutional collaboration, ANZIS is already producing intriguing results and will be very well placed to inform policymakers on how best to deal with future climate change. Professor Lionel Carter, who first joined us in Episode 2, has had a prolific earth science career in New Zealand, Antarctica, and everywhere in between, making him the obvious choice to lead the ANZIS program and to introduce it to us now. Well, welcome back to the show, Lionel. It's good to have you with us again. Thanks, Matt. It's uh, pretty good to be here. I guess we should start at the start and ask the obvious question. What is ANZIS? Well, we all struggle to make acronyms, and ANZIS is just another one. But for most people, ANZ will stand for Australia, New Zealand. In this context, it's Antarctica, New Zealand, interglacial, interglacials being the warm periods, climatic extremes. So ANZIS, Antarctic, New Zealand, interglacial, climate extremes. And obviously, with any science initiative like this, there's got to be key questions that you're trying to answer What are those key questions in the case of ANZIS? The fundamental question is, how does New Zealand respond to warm periods? Because we are in a warm period, whether we like it or not. So instead of waiting till we arrive at those warm times, we're going back in time and looking at past periods which were excessively warm, perhaps one to three degrees warmer than now, and looking at the environmental responses to that warming. In that way, we can gauge... For example, how the ocean responded, ocean currents, how the plankton changed their production, how the ice responded in Antarctica. And, of course, we're extending the study in land because New Zealand's a island nation and very much influenced by the ocean. So in conjunction with the ocean change studies, we're also looking at how the terrestrial climate changed by looking at the geological records preserved in lake sediments primarily and to a lesser extent some glacial sediments in the South Island. So just to clarify, is it about how Antarctica and New Zealand separately respond to global climatic shifts, or is it about how New Zealand responds to climatic shifts via changes in Antarctica? It's both. Obviously, as Antarctica changes, so does New Zealand, because Antarctica very much influences our climate, It also influences the ocean currents that come our way, which in their own way affect the climate. But climate not only affects Antarctica, but it also affects New Zealand. When Antarctica warms, so does New Zealand warm. So we're looking at both effects, direct warming on New Zealand and the surrounding ocean, direct warming on Antarctica, and the effect of, for example, a melting Antarctica on New Zealand. Now, ANZIS is built around three interdependent research streams, We've got Antarctic climate drivers, Southern Ocean New Zealand responses, and climate modelling. And then, of course, the scientific output needs to be translated into a form that can be communicated to the public and policymakers. Could you introduce the various people involved in ANZIS and the kind of work that they each contribute? We're very lucky to be in a university where we have a great pool of talent. In the Antarctic Research Centre, we have Nancy Bertler, who's looking after the ice part of ANZICE. She's basically focusing on the ice cores and the history they contain and how that history of Antarctic change potentially influences New Zealand. In the ocean, we've got Gavin Dunbar. Gavin has a lot of experience in looking at past environmental change from the very small fossils preserved in sediment cores. On shore, we're integrating with other groups outside and within the university, with people at GNS Science and NIWA. We're starting to look at the pollen and the other indicators in lake sediments, which show how the terrestrial climate changed. Now, all this is all very well, but what are you going to do with it? So our approach is to say, well, 
two things. Let's get the science right, and then that forms a fantastic foundation for computer models. Computer models get a lot of bad press, but in reality, they're just a remarkable way of testing scientific hypotheses. Are they good or are they bad? We couldn't get along without them. People think they're direct predictions. They aren't. They're just a means of testing what we're seeing and is it correct. So in that context, we've again got two very talented people, Brian Anderson, who is a modeler working in the Southern Alps, looking at how the Alpine glaciers have changed with time. That has great implications because obviously we rely on that ice to provide water for hydroelectric storage for the very thirsty Canterbury Plains. And of course, there's great tourism aspects about ice in the Alps. And looking after the whole modelling section is Andrew McIntosh, who's a very talented modeller and glaciologist. We also felt that it's all very well doing the science and running the models, but unless that information goes that one step further to people who make decisions about the environment, it has limited use. So we've teamed up with Sean Weaver, who's taking the science and basically transforming it into policy aspects. So we make the science highly available to non-scientists, then in that context, they can utilise their results to plan for New Zealand's future. I guess research initiatives like this would generally fall into one of two major groups. There's cases of science for science's own sake, you know, exploring interesting questions without necessarily having any practical purpose. And then cases of highly results-driven applied science that can be used to tackle real-world problems Anzai sounds like it very much lies in that second group. The program is currently in the third year of a four-year timeline. In that time, have you had direct interaction with the New Zealand government with regard to, say, planning for climate change, or are your efforts more aimed at contributing to the next assessment report of the IPCC? We're running it on a number of fronts, and you've touched on two of them. Getting the science right Getting the science published in peer-reviewed journals is essential. That has to be done before it is even considered by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So that's one aspect. Getting the science completed, peer-reviewed and published, that's basically setting the gold standard and you work from there. Once you think you have the science right, then we start to develop the policy. Now, at the moment, it's early days. The science now is just coming to fruition, and now we're starting to develop that into policy. And from that point onwards, we start to take that to uh, governmental bodies, to government itself, to explain the results and their implications for New Zealand. I should mention that ANZIS is funded by the New Zealand Foundation for Research Science and Technology, that group also funds a similar program at GNS Science called Global Change Through Time. ANZIS has very close ties with that GNS program and also with NIWA. What has been the main motivation for the collaboration between the Antarctic Research Centre and these other two Wellington-based institutions? New Zealand is small. The population of New Zealand fits into Sydney. So even though we are an independent country, this smallness basically compels us to collaborate. It's really not much use competing, but pooling your resources. And of course, the National Institute of Water and Atmosphere, NIWA, and GNS have their own expertise, their own facilities, which we don't have at the university. So by pooling this expertise, we really get the best of all those three worlds, the ocean, the land and from ourselves at the Antarctic Research Centre, the ice. So bringing those three elements together and using the expertise available at the three institutions really is essential. I'm going to say the program would fall down without those collaborations. For example, NIWA provides access to sediment cores that have been collected around the ocean. GNS have expertise in paleontology. They run radiocarbon dating, which is a key part of ANZICE, dating cores. In Victoria's context, we provide very high quality geochemistry labs. We also collaborate with institutions overseas, for example, with ice cores. Some of the uh, analyses of the gas trapped in the ice is sent to the University of Maine. So this internal network between the three institutions, plus a rather broader network with other uh, institutions overseas, 
in these days is essential. You can't have all the expertise in one house. It's impossible. So by merging those, New Zealand gets the very best out of its science. So as you mentioned earlier, in Anzais, you're investigating periods of past warmth, one example of which is the Holocene climatic optimum that occurred around 7,000 years ago. Now, another important period is what's known as marine isotope stage 5E, that is the last interglacial period that occurred around 125,000 years ago, immediately before the onset of the last ice age. How do global temperatures during stage 5E compare to those of today? The ocean temperatures, for example, were about one to two degrees warmer than now. Ice melted in Greenland and Antarctica, and sea level was between three to six metres higher than present. That's the latest range put out. So it was a time when the earth was warmer, but CO2 concentrations weren't excessive. They were about 300 parts per million. We're now 390 parts per million, so we're well out of our comfort zone. And of course, the planet is warming in some parts very rapidly. There are various climatic phenomena documented in Anzice results so far that could be seen to be contrary to a global warming trend. I'm thinking here of localised cooling in Antarctica, uh, anomalous advancing of West Coast glaciers here in New Zealand, yet these signals have been explained in terms of a backdrop of global warming. It seems to me that a major contribution of the Anzice program will be to clear up some of these currently misconstrued and therefore contentious issues. And I guess that's up to the science to explain those complexities. One of the large problems about understanding climate change, and uh, it's a totally understandable problem, is that its variables all get out. If you were living in Europe there last winter, you were witnessing one of the coldest winters uh, on record. If you shifted over to Vancouver, they were crying out for snow for the winter games. The lesson is that climate change is variable. It varies through time and it varies from place to place. We see that in New Zealand. Sea level rise off Wellington is very much uh, affected by the uplift of the land. In Auckland, which is a lot more stable, you get a more steady record of sea level rise. You see sea level rise affected by El Nino-La Nina cycles. There's a whole range of variability with climate change and it's up to us to sort out that variability But when you do that, the observations are still there. Global sea level is rising at 3.2 millimetres per year. That's just a straight observation. Once you take out all this variability associated with climate, associated with the land going up and down, you still see this undeniable upward trend. But I think it's one of the important things for science to explain this variability to sort out what's the up and down bits and what is the uh, real long-term trend and convey that to the public. Once that's done in a clear manner, I think they start to understand that we are dealing with something where some winters we will be colder than others. Uh, In El Nino years, we may get cooler ocean or in La Nina years, warmer ocean. That is all this variability which is superimposed on this longer-term change we're seeing. I sort of liken it to walking upstairs playing with a yo-yo. The yo-yo going up and down and you're walking up the stairs going up and down is all that variability, but the trend is upwards as you move up the stairs. So looking ahead to the completion of the program at the end of next year, based on its successes so far, do you feel optimistic about Anzice's potential to really make some positive difference in not only the scientific community, but in the public and political arenas as well? Oh, without a doubt. The results we're starting to see from Anne's ice are showing quite dramatic changes in the New Zealand environment during a warm period. Just to use one example, what we're seeing in the very warm periods is that the plankton in the ocean change quite dramatically. During coolish periods, they tend to be basically dominated by animals. And then as we go into a warm period, it's as if a switch is turned and we change from the animal-based plankton into one which is dominated by plant or algal plankton. And we're starting to see this change not only in the sediments, where it is quite pronounced, but also from satellite observations. So we've seen it in the past when water temperatures were one to two degrees warmer. We're starting to see it now from satellite observations, these switches and these 
distinct and extensive plankton blooms forming off New Zealand and other places around the world. So this is a straight observation from ANZAIS. We're working now on the conditions which bring about these changes. And then the next step is what will happen to the marine food chain if you change the base, if you change from an animal-based plankton to a plant-based plankton? Really fundamental questions. But this sort of material is starting to come to fruition now. The modelling has been highly successful. For the Alps, we have, to my mind, quite sophisticated models showing how the Southern Alps will behave under various weather conditions. And this is really quite exciting work. So, yes, ANZAIS is producing the science, but as I mentioned before, that's only the first step. That science has to be peer-reviewed to get the gold seal of approval. That is underway. Once we've done that, it's got two roads. One road will go to IPCC, where it will feed directly into the uh, fifth assessment of climate change. And the other road will go directly into generating easily understood results that apply to policy. So we will sort of change the language, which I agree can be quite confusing or full of jargon, into plain English results, which then feed into policy to help New Zealand meet the challenges. Well, thanks for your time today, Lionel. I hope the rest of Anne's Ice goes well. You're actually the first return interviewee on Journeys to the Ice, so I'm glad we didn't scare you away the first time. No, not at all. It's good, Matt. For more Journeys to the Ice, visit cyblogs.co.nz forward slash journeys to the ice. <laughs>